Hello, good afternoon, uh, good morning, or um, good evening, everyone, depending on which part of the world you're currently in. Uh, my name is Ron from International Trade Council, so I will be the moderator for today's webinar. Our title of the webinar is Why Email Marketing is Worthy Investment and Three Things to Improve ROI. In this webinar, participants will learn why email marketing is still the best marketing channel, learn three things that will justify and improve your investment, identify items that will impede your success, hear best practices for, for email marketing. Our speaker for today is Hank Hoffmeier, Senior Manager of Client Solutions, President-elect of AMA Triangle. So before we start, I just want to make sure that um, the audio is clear uh, for those uh, participants that is currently logged in. Can you please type in yes on the comment section? Um, Prasant, Rakibul, and Nancy, if you can hear me, please type in yes on the comment section before we start. I just want to make sure that the audio is clear. All right, perfect. Thank you so much for that for responding. So without, oh, by the way, before I hand over the stage to him, if you have any question, feel free to type in your questions on the comment section here, and then he will be able to answer the question after the presentation. So without any further ado, I will hand over the stage to our speaker. Go ahead, sir. Thanks, Ron. I appreciate uh, everybody coming today, and it's great to be here. What I want to do is ask you a question. Have you ever won a trophy or an award you may have or you may not have. Feels good, right? Growing up for me, when it comes to sports, I never really excelled at them. I tried soccer. I tried football. I failed miserably. I quickly found that I'm technical in nature. I like to build computers. I like to figure out problems. And my passion turned out to be in marketing, which is what I'm doing now. When I started with eye contact 12 years ago, I won an award the first year I was there. It's the Eye Contact Account Management Excellence Award. It was a huge award. It looks like this. It's big, it's crystal, it's heavy. And it still sits on my shelf just as a reminder of how well I did using technology rather than playing sports. You might be thinking, why am I talking about awards? Well, there's a thing called MVP, Most Valuable Player. Sports have MVPs. Why shouldn't marketing have MVPs? To me, email marketing is the MVP of marketing. That's what we're here to talk about today because year after year, email marketing wins the MVP award. If you're an influencer, content creator, marketer, or you're in a C-suite, whatever, you need to make sure that you put email marketing into play so that it can win you that MVP award every single year. Again, my name is Hank Hotmeyer. I'm the digital marketing infotainer. I like to make marketing fun and successful. Follow me on all the socials at Hank Hoffmeyer. It's hard to miss me. Uh, my big channels are Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, as well as LinkedIn and TikTok. Follow me for more great information. Let's talk about email. Why email marketing and why is email important? Why is it the MVP of marketing? Well, it's 40% more effective than other channels like social media, pay-per-click, and even print media, which, believe it or not, is starting to make a little bit of a comeback because of the pandemic. 61% of American workers say email marketing or getting email is crucial to doing business. In other words, they are in their inbox and they read emails. And for folks that might be doing B2B marketing, 83% of B2B marketers live and die by using email marketing. Those stats are impressive. With social media, it's hard to get really good numbers and good ROI and get good traction. But with email marketing, it's a no-brainer. It's that player you need to get off the bench and put them into the game. If you've been doing email marketing for a while, hopefully I'll give you some new ideas. And if you haven't gotten started, hopefully I'm going to encourage and inspire you to get started today. Because what I'm trying to tell you is email marketing works. It's simple as that. Also, I like to point out when you grow an email subscriber list, you own those contacts or those subscribers. If you build a following on, say, TikTok, Instagram, or Facebook, and something happens to your account or it gets banned, you lose all of those followers. You do not own them. With email marketing, you own your contacts. With me so far? 
hope I'm not putting you to sleep. Hope I'm not acting like the water boy on the team. And I'm giving you some information to help you understand that email marketing is important. To shift gears, let's talk about starting off right or getting back on track with your email marketing campaigns. Three things for this section, sign up forms, welcome emails, and the content you use with your email marketing programs. Sign up forms that live on either a website or your landing page are very important to use to grow your list because it's an excellent way to add subscribers to your platform, to your email marketing service, whatever you want to call it. That's how you grow your list, using forms and getting people to sign up. Make sure when you create these forms that it has your logo and information, if it's on a landing page or somewhere, use your the same colors that your branding uses. This way you do not create confusion because people are very hesitant to give away their information if they don't know where it's going or how it's going to be used. An important tip is only ask for the information you need to start a relationship with someone. To me, that's the email address. But you can also get away with asking for the first name so that you can personalize your emails. Anything above and beyond that, it might cause friction and people will not give you information. In other words, if I'm signing up for a coupon for a retail store, if they ask me for my first name, last name, email address, make and model of my car, how much money I paid in taxes last year, and my favorite ice cream flavor, I probably would not want to give that to them just for a 20% coupon because I don't know what they want that information for and how they would use it. In a simplistic fashion, add a sign-up form to your website. ColourPop does a great job with just a simple sign-up form, asking for your email address, and then you click enter. There you go. You're going to start getting emails from them. You can also use pop-up forms. These are forms that live on your website, and after a period of time, they pop up and ask for you to sign up. You should be careful with using pop-ups because if I come to your website by Google search or maybe through a tweet or some other social media link, and I don't really know what you do yet, and you automatically put a, a pop-up in my face, I probably will not fill it out. Time those pop-ups. Maybe it's 20 seconds, 30 seconds. Give them time to look around. Or better yet, use something called exit intent technology. When someone goes to leave your website by closing a browser, switching to a different tab, typing in the URL, when they go and lose focus of that window, you serve them that pop-up and incentivize them to give you an email address. Now, those are some simple ways to grow your list by using landing pages, websites with sign-up forms. Remember I mentioned only asking for the name and an email address, but there are situations where you can ask for more information. The first one is with restaurants. I don't know about you, but I like free food or at least a discounted meal. Restaurants can get away with asking for birthday. When is your birthday? So we can send you a coupon for either discounted or a free meal, discounted food or a free meal. And then you also have the opportunity to ask people their preferences of what emails they want. Is it emails for certain restaurants in certain areas or like Bangkok newsletter on the right hand side is asking, do you want all of our emails or do you want to know about food in Bangkok? Maybe you just want our PDF magazine or you're interested in nightlife. It's a great way to give your subscribers what they want rather than what you want to send. And that's important is make sure that you treat your subscribers with the respect they deserve, not just sending them nonsense of, about information that they do not want. Here is a landing page for eye contact. Uh, what you can do also to grow your list is share out QR codes that work and drive people back to uh, your website, a landing page, wherever. You can even use these to get people to follow you on social media. Now, this one just goes back to the eye contact site. I put it in here as an example. And you can see that it is simple to use. And you'll notice there's branding on it. I use QR code monkey for this, which allows you to brand the QR code. That helps with trust because there's a lot of concern going around with QR codes, especially if they're not like on a restaurant menu of, are they trying to steal my information? By adding the logo, you're giving people confidence in your branding, like I mentioned earlier. QR codes are making a comeback, especially from the pandemic. Restaurants are using them heavily, and I've seen them more and more. Uh, I've seen McDonald's had a huge one on their window, and it was basically a coupon. Scan it, get the coupon. Couldn't miss it. I could probably scan it from a mile away. That's how big it was. All right, you're growing your list. You're starting to get email subscribers, and you're growing. You're happy. What happens? You obtain the email address, 
What happens? I mean, really, really, what happens? If you're not immediately sending them what's called a welcome email, you're missing the boat, folks. You don't want to get an email address and then wait a month and send them an email. They'll probably forget who you are, ignore your email, or worse, mark it as spam. I went to a local, well, actually, it's a, it's a national sports store, and I needed something from that sports store. As I was going in, I saw something on their window said, 30% off if you sign up for our newsletter. I signed up. I sat there for a moment or two, did not get an email, did not get the coupon. I sat down on a bench outside of this store, and I waited for about 20 minutes. I wasn't just staring in the space or people watching. I was scrolling TikTok and Instagram, going back to my inbox every now and then. You know what? I never received it. It took about three days for me to get that coupon and it irritated me. I did leave after about 20 minutes and I went to their competitor and bought what I needed out of spite. But that shows you the importance of using welcome messages. It helps set expectations. Thank you, Hank, for signing up for our emails. Here's what you can expect. Maybe a little bit more of a value statement. And if you want to, you can include an incentive you can also get people to sign up for your social media accounts and get them to follow you there by adding that to the welcome message if they're not already following you. Make sure you send it right away. If you're using a sign-up form from, say, iContact or many other platforms, you can add that to your website or landing page, and that will automatically add them into the platform in real time, and you can trigger an email to go out right away. If you are at a conference and you're getting cards or you're writing down email addresses, Go ahead and add them as soon as you can and then trigger that welcome email to go out. It gives you an opportunity to ask to be whitelisted so that you can make sure that your emails get to the inbox. In other words, ask them to add your email address to their address book or just engage with the email. And I already mentioned you can put an offer in a welcome email sometimes, especially if you're a retailer or e-commerce, it's something to be desired. It could be a call to action like booking a call or anything like that. Let's look at some examples. SurfStitch personalizes this email, uses the first name, and they're giving you a warm welcome and a 20% off coupon. And I love how they have the big hero image at the top with text over it. It makes you feel good. It's a simple welcome message that works. Otter AI is being playful and they're asking for engagement right away. In other words, they're asking you to say, hey, how are you using our platform so far? little secret here, that is a good form of engagement and helps with delivering your emails. And we'll talk about that later, but it's important to get people to engage with your emails. Remember that, plant that seed in the back of your mind. We're going to come back to that. Now you have email subscribers, you sent your welcome message. Let's talk about the content you are putting into your emails so that they are viewed, opened, and then engaged with. You want to make them feel warm and fuzzy to have a relationship with you. Because half the times when I'm in my inbox, this is what it looks like. It's just a mess. There's so many emails, pages and pages and pages of in my work email. There's even more over there. You have to stand out from the crowd when you send your emails. And the first thing people see, the subject line. Start personalizing your subject lines. I already told you, ask for the email address, ask for the first name. Now, if you're in another industry where you're looking to give quotes to people, obviously you can ask for company name, maybe the company size. If they feel it's relevant to provide that for a quote, they'll probably do that. But first name and email address, you can personalize. Hank, comma, we have a sale this week would be the subject line. Use emoji. Not enough marketers use emoji to stand out in the inbox. I see a lot of marketers use emoji around the holidays, but then they stop using them. And that gives you an opportunity to make sure your emails or your subject lines are seen in the inbox. Your subject line should be about six to 10 words in length. Otherwise, it will get cut off in the inbox and people will not read it and see it. And maybe it might not make sense if it's getting cut off, especially if the important part of your subject line is at the end. A-B testing is a powerful tool. And if you're not using it currently or you're just getting started, you need to use A-B testing. You're going to take a version of your email. Let's say it's a subject line test. Take one version, same content, one subject line, send it to 10% of a list. Take another version, version B, and then send that to another 10% of a list. Let it simmer. Let it bake in overnight, maybe 24 to 48 hours. Go back, take a look. Now we're looking at opens for subject lines. Whichever one has the higher open rate, you want to send the remaining 80% the winning email. 
I worked with a client a long time ago that said, I don't know why marketers don't always use A-B testing. It's like getting free email, op free opens with every send. And that's true because you're sending the better performing email. You can also test links. You can test content. You can test length. There's so many different things you can test. But my recommendation is only test one element at a time so that you know what's working. And as a pro tip, make sure you're using what's called preview text. Remember how I said your subject line should be about six to 10 words in length? Well, the thing is here, you wanna make sure that you have a strong subject line with emojis, like you see in the example here, but right after that is the preview text. This is the bit of text that shows up after the subject line. It's like what Robin is to Batman. They make up the dynamic duo. The preview text is an extension of your subject line. Years ago, marketers used to put, can I view this email? Click here to view online. And that's a waste of valuable real estate. Use it effectively. Two-day super sale. This Friday and Saturday only get 20% off. You know, get a 20% off coupon. That helps you elongate your message in the inbox with preview text. Here are some subject lines that worked. Look at these open rates for these subject lines. You might say, well, wow, how did somebody think of these? These are actual eye contact clients that have sent these subject lines that actually worked. At the end of this presentation, I wanna give you an opportunity to get our ultimate subject line guide, which has 501 examples of good and bad subject lines broken down by message type and industry. I'll get that to you by the end of today's session. Hopefully you'll enjoy it. Once you start sending emails, they need to look good. I love Apple. They do a good job of selling their products. They let the product speak for itself. They use something called white space. You see a lot of space around the text, around the images. Everything is not really just cluttered in this email. And if you know Apple, you know that they are minimalistic with their marketing and let the product speak for itself. Simple text button if you're ready to buy or learn more, and then the product itself. Then you have story. They're using something called negative space because it's not white space, but they have a little bit of buffer around their content. And more importantly, I love how they have a black and white theme. It's kind of, it's kind of toned down and the images invoke your emotions and make you want to click through to either watch the video or read the article laid out very well. And speaking about layout, you can use something called the classic Z pattern. When we read in English, we read from left to right and down. And that's a great way to lay out a longer email where you go left to right and down and it keeps people going down, scrolling or moving through your email. Maybe if it's shorter, you can go ahead and use what's called the inverted pyramid. You have large information at the top, such as a hero image, and then below that, some text, which is a little bit narrower than your button. It's even narrower. Psychologically, your eyes go down and you're viewing all of the content. Make use of the Z pattern or the inverted pyramid in some of your future emails or when you get started. I always like to use the squint test when I build my emails or even a landing page. Go ahead and create your landing page or your email and step back from the monitor and squint. Squint pretty hard, so it's hard to see. I know this is not your monitor, it's actually blurred out. If you can tell what's going on and you still see some of the space and you can still see the layout of the email, you won. You won the challenge, the squint test challenge. It's a great way to make sure your emails are not cluttered. Humans are visual by nature. We love to see images and we love to consume video. Use images in your video that really matter. High quality images of your product and service. Try not to use stock photography uh, if you can help it. Use your own or have someone create some. Images help drive emotion, help people consume content, as well as video. These are my friends at Litmus. They are an email testing service. Uh, so how you can see emails, how they look in different email platforms and do some testing, check them out if you need them. But they use a video here to help you get started and help you get information about email marketing. Why is video important? Right now, 80% of marketing is video. It's important to use video in your marketing, folks. And if you're not doing it now, bite the bullet and start doing it. 95% of content in video is retained versus 10% in text. In other words, when I watch a video, I can retain more of the information I'm consuming versus what I'm reading. And that's why email marketing and video go hand in hand. The most important thing 
for your email marketing campaigns is value. You have to provide value to your email subscribers. As a marketer, we should not be pushing what we want, putting out the content that we want, that we feel is important. Learn about your subscribers, learn about your audience, provide them with information that's valuable with, to them. You'll build a relationship and that's where the conversions come in. That's where you get a better ROI. I like to use the bank analogy. Send out content that's very helpful and not always asking for a sale. It's like making deposits. And after time, you can ask for the withdrawal. State Farm is a great example. They're my insurance company. And I have my auto and my homeowner's insurance with them. I do not have life insurance with them. Should they be sending me an email every week trying to sell me life insurance? No. But they could talk about the benefits of life insurance. They always tell me how to keep my car ready to go if I'm going to go on a long vacation and drive pretty far. And they also help me keep my health safe from burglaries. And they also help me with home improvements by giving me tips or information about different projects. Then at some point, they can come in a little bit harder and sell me on the life insurance. That is making deposits and making withdrawals. Well, you, if you have not read this book by Gary Vaynerchuk, Jab, 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 Right Hook, I highly recommend it. It's a really awesome book. It's really geared towards social media, but it works with any type of marketing. Same thing, deposit, deposit, withdrawal, jab, 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 right hook, or I, I like to say, give them the uppercut, knock them out and get that conversion. With the bank analogy, you're making your deposits and you're making some withdrawals. Just make sure that you're not making more withdrawals than deposits because you'll overdraft your email marketing bank account. Moving on, now you're, you're sending great emails, they look good. Subject lines are awesome. You're growing your list. We need to make sure your emails are getting delivered. Sometimes the mailman might not deliver your mail. It might get lost. The dog might pull it out of the mailbox and chew on it and spit it out somewhere and you never see it. Not all mail is delivered. And the same thing happens with email marketing. We're going to go some, through some technical items here. And I encourage you to ask questions at the end of today's session or reach out to me because this is something that is very time consuming. But no matter what platform you're using or decide to use, there should be someone to help you. I'm going to explain what this is so you have enough information to have an intelligent conversation. Well, first, make sure you're going to avoid traps and blacklists. Never buy an email marketing list. Never rent an email marketing list. Never take cards from a fishbowl and just enter them into your email platform and start emailing them. There are certain email addresses from different providers, Gmail, Yahoo, AOL, and private domains that have active email addresses, but they're called spam traps. If you send to them, you're going to get in trouble. And if enough people report you, you can get put on a, what's called a blacklist. And if you're on a blacklist and you're sending to certain providers, they will not let your emails even get into the inbox or the spam folder. They're going to block you. That's why it's important to use permission-based email marketing. Ask people, whether it's on a form or in person, can I send you an email or can I add you to my email list? It's the best way to go about it. Now, when you're sending emails, there's technical items called SPF, DCAM, and DMARC. I have a slide, uh, the next slide that will explain this in detail, so hold off on that. Uh, but make sure you're using quality content because that engagement matters. We were talking about quant content that matters and it's valuable but also adding quality and value to your emails matters more than ever. And we're going to talk about that too. All right. SPF stands for sender policy framework. Every time you send an email, if you're using a platform, say eye contact, it's coming from your domain and it's being sent by eye contact. The recipient server might say, Hey, I noticed it's coming from this company, but eye contact sent it. Does eye contact have permission to send these emails? In other words, is it being spoofed? And that's happened. You think it's coming from a company you know, but not really. If you add this SPF to your domain, which with eye contact, we automatically do this. You don't have to. Some platforms or some providers, you may have to talk to them and they'll help you set this up on your domain or with your hosting provider. But it's a text record that just says this provider or eye contact has permission to send these emails. The second one is domain keys identified mail. This dictates that this email that you're sending has not been altered, injected, or changed in any way since it left eye contact servers 
and went to the recipient server. It has not been injected with malware. This is something that needs to be set up on your hosting provider by you, by your IT team, or somebody in marketing. Something we can help you with, and hopefully if you're using another platform, they can help you with that. The last one, domain-based message authentication, reporting, and conformance, basically is a rule that says, hey, if there is no SPF and DKIM on this email, what do we do with it? Do we ignore it or do we let it through? There's some pretty cool reporting that comes along with that. You could see who is spoofing your email addresses by using DMARC. So SPF, DKIM, and DMARC, not hard to set up, hard to understand. I can help you through it no matter what provider you're using. My contact helps get you halfway there. But this is something you should talk to your provider about just to make sure you're set up and you're doing what's called authentication. That's what this is called, email authentication. Next, every time you send an email, it's being graded. It's being analyzed. And there's good things and bad things that happen when you send emails. And I like to think about it as a credit score. When you send emails, there might be positive things that happen. And what are some positive things? And, and if we are in person, I'd probably hear you say open. Yeah, open, engagement, like clicking, forwarding, replying, marking is important, clicking on links. All those are forms of positive engagement. And there's something called TINs. This is not spam. Especially in Gmail, if somebody goes in and says your email is not spam in the spam folder, it shows Gmail or whatever provider that the email is in that these emails are wanted and it gives you a positive score. So it's building your score. Now on the negative side or what's called a detractor, you have complaints or spam, right? People marking your message as spam. People that unsubscribe, click the unsubscribe link and the bounce rate. And I have some rates here. And when you see 0.1%, that's one per thousand. So when you're sending to a thousand people, you want one or less people to complain, you know, five or less to unsubscribe, and then the bounce rate about 1% of the send you're doing. The most important one is non-engagement. Folks, if people get your emails and they do nothing, they forget about them, it actually hurts your domain reputation, which is that credit score. Your domain that you're sending from has this credit score. It's called domain reputation. And once it gets to a low point, let's say a 60 or 70, I'm just making up numbers here, more of your emails go to the spam folder, especially new people. Want to make sure that people are opening, engaging, and telling people your email is not spam so that you get into the inbox. And everything we've talked about factors in here, that quality, providing subscribers with what they want, not what you want to send. All of that matters. Now, if you know a lot about email marketing and deliverability, you might say, well, doesn't the IP address or who you're sending with matter? In other words, when you use somebody like iContact, you're using our IP addresses. Unless you have a dedicated IP, which is under your purview, that IP address also has a score, but it's weighted a lot less than your domain reputation. In other words, if you have a good or bad domain reputation and you move to another provider from one that you're using now, that follows you. Therefore, always follow best practices. Now let's step up and make some three-point shots. Let's get some extra points so that you can further your ROI with email marketing. And that can be done with segmentation as well as automation. Let's hop in and talk about segmentation. Segmentation is a filtered view of your email contacts. Let's say you want to use the birthday of your subscribers. I'm a restaurant or however I get a birthday. Uh, I want to see everyone that's on my list that has a birthday in March. I would simply go in and create a segment of all my contacts that have the birthday field that has March in. That's a simple way to create a segment. Segmented emails are, are really good. You can get a higher click-through rate, up to 50% higher click-through rate by sending the right emails. 88% of users agree they're more likely to respond to an email if it looks like it was specifically crafted for them. Do you want to send your whole list an email saying happy birthday every month? Maybe once a year, you'll be correct, but I don't have two, three, or 12 birthdays a month. Same thing with if I have shown an affinity for a certain product or service and you have multiple products or services, only send me what I seem to be engaged with. Or if you're getting information from me, use that to create segmentation that will help you target your customer better. And we're going to talk more about segmentation in a moment or so too. 
I feel like there are four pillars of segmentation. And the first one is demographic. It is their age, gender, education, and occupation. My favorite is psychographic, lifestyle, values, concerns, personalities, attitudes, and what I call AIO, activities, interests, and opinions, because everybody has them. Now, as I'm going through this, you might think, well, Hank, you said I need an email address and first name to start a relationship with someone, and I don't want to ask for all this information on my sign-up form. Yep, true. I agree with you, but a great way to get this information is through surveys or get people to go back to their profile and eye contact or whatever platform you're using to fill it out more. You can put custom fields or standard fields in there and let them fill it out and give you that information. Tell them by giving us more or better information, we can give you better emails. We'll provide you with more value. The third one is behavioral. What are they doing or not doing? Are people opening your emails, not opening them, clicking, not clicking? If you want to integrate your website, are they visiting your website, not visiting, purchasing, not purchasing? What kind of signals are they giving you? And a lot of times marketers always look at people that don't open emails. Send an email, wait a couple of days, segment the people that didn't open that email and resend that same email. What about your folks that are doing really well or have spent a lot of money or have been opening or clicking your emails? Treat them good. Give them discounts as well. You can also look at people that have not opened in a while and put them onto a Facebook list and serve them ads. It's, it's called retargeting. Take the list of people who haven't engaged in a while, upload them to Facebook, and serve them ads. Last and fourth, we have geographic. Where are they? What country, city, or what is the density of the location they live in? You might need this if you do events and you want to serve emails to people if you're having a concert or having an uh, in-person webinar somewhere. This would be an important piece of information. That is the four pillars of segmentation. Now, we're going to talk about using segmentation with automation. Automation is convincing the right people to need what you have at the right time. Sending the right message to the right person at the right time. That's what segmentation and automation allows you to do. Nine out of 10 marketers use more than one form of marketing automation software. By implementing marketing automation, how much, how many more qualified leads do you think you can get? You know, if you're thinking 5, 10, 15, 50%, you're wrong because it's actually 451%. That's the increase in qualified leads you will get if you implement marketing automation. But you have to feed the machine. Feed the machine data information, birthday, favorite color, location. That's all stagnant or static data that you can use in your marketing automation. Then there's triggers. What are they doing and not doing? Did they open this email, not open this email? Did they visit my website? Did they convert? Did they not convert? Did they buy more than $500 of product or services from me in the last year? I love marketing automation because it allows you to nurture people. First and foremost, you can automate that welcome email or better yet, a welcome series or a nurture series. Have a set cadence of emails that goes out to your subscribers telling them about you and or your business. Again, these can be triggered based on list subscription when they're added to a list. They can be triggered on doing something or not doing something and also by data. Today's consumer is more empowered than ever. We all have a device that can fit in the palm of our hand to allow us to do research, compare pricing, look for reviews, recommendations. Long gone are the days where you can just send out marketing content and get people to convert right away. People take time and you need to nurture them to a sale. Let's use the example of adding somebody to a list that triggers a nurture series. On day zero or right away, we're going to send that welcome message because we don't want to send it at the end of the month, like I mentioned earlier. Maybe the next day you'll send them an emotional appeal email. This is saying, please buy for me. I need the money. Just kidding. This is where you appeal to your subscriber or contact emotions. This is where you use those videos, those images that talk about you and your company and why they should do business with you, why they should have a relationship with you, why they should buy from you. Next, on day five, we can send an email that talks about how we're different from our competitors or how we stand out from the crowd. Maybe you'll have information about your return policy, your support policy, what you're doing in the community. 
you're building this relationship with people over time and you're automating it. And maybe day seven, you're going to give them that incentive. Buy now and we'll give you 20% off. We'll give you 30% off, a few coupon, free consultation. Whatever it is you do, you can offer an incentive here. And all along the way, you can do checks and balances. You can send that welcome email, wait three days, see if somebody did or did not open or I would say click in an email because things are changing. Go ahead and anybody who did not click a link in that email, resend a welcome message with a different subject line and maybe some tweak content. And then anyone else who did click a link on there, you know they opened it or clicked, right? You can send them another email down that path. You can do these checks and balances along the way. And if you have purchase data, you could check to see if they bought from you or became a customer and stop a certain sequence if you want to. You can automate birthday emails. Just have that go out once every year. Thank you for your purchase. Here are some alternative products. Uh, more informative information uh, about products and services you have, or maybe you're trying to promote a webinar and you can use a date-based automation series for that. My webinar is on April 20th, 15 days before I send this email, 10 days before this email, five days before day of, and then thank you two days after. A lot of great ways to use automation. All right, I'm going to call a timeout here. Hopefully you're thinking about the best ways to use automation. But for me, there's really one way to use automation in such a powerful fashion. Here's a hint. Do you, I wonder if you know what it is. I want you to be clean as a whistle. And with that, I mean, you need to perform list hygiene. It's the act of removing your inactive contacts to help you with deliverability. Remember, I told you if people are ignoring your email or not opening them, it actually hurts you. because let's say, let's use Gmail, they have the strictest algorithm. You have 100 Gmail subscribers and 70 or 80 or 80% 80 of them are not opening your emails. Gmail looks at that and thinks you're irrelevant and they'll start sending more and more of your emails to spam. What I normally recommend is identifying non-openers and sending them what's called a re-engagement campaign. But Apple in iOS 15 and on the iPad and on the Mac have introduced some privacy features that automatically count an email is open if you send to someone using the built-in email app in the iPhone, iPad, or on a Mac. In other words, right now, if I got an email from you on my iPhone in the email app on my iPhone, I opened it. Even though I didn't touch my phone, I didn't unlock it or anything. It counts as an open. They're also blocking some tracking that's going on. And historically, marketers will look at people who have not opened an email in the last six months or the last year and then start sending them emails saying, are we breaking up? You know, have, please come back. I would say really look at people who have not clicked on an email in the last six months or the last year, depending on how often you send. If you send once a month, I would say uh, every six months is a good cadence. If you send once a week, oh, I'm sorry, once a week, do it six months, once a year, if you send once a month. It's an easy way to look at it and make sure you're putting a lot of engaging content in your email. People click so you can measure whether they're clicking or not. And let's talk about setting up this re-engagement journey. We miss you. Subject line, maybe add emoji to that. It lets people know that you're trying to get in touch with them, remind them why they signed up in the first place and give them an opportunity to change what they receive. Maybe you do send weekly. You can set up a list and people can opt in to only get something monthly. Give them what they want. Message two, please come back. You're looking at people who have not opened or clicked in the first one and give them special discounts and coupon codes to come back. Then be a man of your word and release people if they do not engage with the last and third message and you've been checking the previous two. Is this goodbye? This you can also prompt them to follow you on social media if email is not their thing, which is an awesome way to get people to come back, but maybe not an email if that's not their thing. But after these three emails, go ahead and remove these people from your, your lists. You could do this with automation as well. If they don't respond to any of these emails, automatically remove them, or you can do it manually. But re-engagement campaigns work. They're pretty effective. Here's one from JetBlue. I really love the imagery here. I love the Band-Aid. They're playing with the idea of breaking up. They're asking you to choose how and when you'd like to be contacted. They're empathetic to your inbox being full, and they show you that they understand that you get a lot of emails. Really like the, the look and feel of this email, it's simple, a lot of white space. Same thing with type form, a lot of white space. They're saying, we noticed you haven't been active in opening our emails. 
They're asking direct questions. There's one CTA in email to get people back to the website and measure whether or not they're engaging with this email. And they're showing you again that they're understanding. Remember, it's all about the subscribers, folks. It's about the subscribers, not you as the marketer. We went through a lot of content. I hope that if you're not using email marketing, you're going to get started. I hope that if you are using email marketing, I gave you some new and fresh ideas. I threw a lot of information and now it's time for you to join team email marketing, study the playbook. Let's go ahead and recap what we talked about. So you have some solid takeaways because there might've been a lot of information. I know this will be recorded. You can go back, but really what I want you to remember, start off by growing your list using or updating your forms, whether it's a pop-up form, an exit intent form, simplifying your form, making sure you're sending the right content and also welcoming your subscribers with open arms and making them feel warm. Then make sure your emails are delivered by using best practices by not buying lists, sending that welcome email right away, using authentication that I spoke about, and have good list hygiene processes. Then go for the extra point using segmentation and automation, especially with list hygiene. How important is list hygiene? I've mentioned it like six times. I think it's very important. That is the MVP playbook. And I want you to go out and make email marketing your MVP. Thank you for your time. Let's all say email marketing on three. One, two, three. Email marketing. Well, wait, hold up. There's more. MVPs get trophies, right? Or maybe not as fancy as my little crystal over here, but I want to induct you into the eye contact email marketing hall of fame because you went through my presentation, which was a lot of information. And I want to dub you an eye contact email marketing expert because I told you the fundamentals today. And if you process those, I consider you an expert. As I promised, here's a QR code. Go ahead and scan that. That will allow you to get the subject line guide and also that cool badge. What I want you to do is if you take that badge, if you download it, please share it on social media, tag eye contact, tag me. Let me know that you're proud of what you learned today. This way we can also start a relationship. We can engage with you on social media and you'll be added to my journal. It's called Hank's Journal. Once a month, I send out an email with cool tools I found to help me get through my day and be organized with marketing. You know, it could be something like Canva, a cool tool, a bookmark tool or something, an add-on. Also tips and tricks about email marketing. And it's just something that comes from me. That's what I ask in return for getting this awesome guide as well as the badge. With that, I thank you for your time. Make sure to follow me at Hank Hoffmeyer on all the socials. But with that, you'll always be an MVP in my heart. Thank you. Thank you for that very uh, interesting and knowledgeable presentation, sir. Um, yep, we're open for... All right, so thank you for your time. Uh, if you have any question, you have his information, so just uh, get back to him. Uh, this uh, webinar is recorded, and they can watch this back in our YouTube channel. So now, if you have any questions, please feel free to type in your questions in the comment section. So we're open for a question now. Sorry about that. I clicked uh, stop share, and it kicked me out. <laughs> yeah, I thought you went out already. So any questions, guys? I hope there's some questions. Email marketing seems simple, but it's not. I encourage you to ask questions. And I know we're virtual a lot of times in person. It's always that first person that has to ask a question, and then it goes on to further things. Um, I guess let me talk about something to let you gather your thoughts. You know, that email authentication I mentioned is important. But not enough people do that. Microsoft adheres to that. So you have to think, when people use Microsoft and, and Google, they also use them as a business. In other words, it's not an at Gmail or at Microsoft email. It could be a business email, but they're using Microsoft and Gmail. And having that authentication is very important. Make sure to set that up. Let me ask you a question if you're not going to ask me questions. How many of you are currently using email marketing? Just go ahead and give me a yes or no, or you want to get started. I hope I didn't put people to sleep. <laughs> we only have like three people on the... Right, on the live. 
Yeah, but a while ago we have like nine, I think. So I I I don't see any questions here. And um, anyway, before we end the session, uh, I would like to give a um, few minutes for you. Uh, maybe final uh, final words from the attendees. Any other things you would like to add? For me, I think it's just important to use email marketing and more importantly, digital marketing in general. Uh, I encourage anybody that's watching or, or watching live to make sure to double down on your content marketing, which is what all of this is, because it is going to become more and more important to brand yourself using the different platforms that are out there and really tying back to the hub that is email marketing, because I mentioned you own your list. That's something that's portable you can take with you to different platforms when you're trying to grow your social platforms, you don't really own those platforms or those subscribers or followers, get them funneled into your email marketing program. Uh, reach out to me on social media. If you have any questions, I'd love to connect and talk. And um, yeah, I think that that is a great you know, last bit of advice. All right. Thank you so much for that, sir. And um, we, we, can, we can conclude the presentation for today. Again, if you have any questions, feel free to reach out to him or you can reach out to us as well. And if you would like to listen again to the presentation, we will going to upload this to our YouTube channel, International Trade Council. So thank you for your time, and we look forward to seeing you again in the next webinar. Have a good day. Thank, thank you, sir. Everybody.